Welcome to Revelations TV's The Interview with me, Doug Harris. And I am delighted uh, to welcome today not one guest uh, to be put in the hot seat, but two, and we can hardly split them up, can we? Paul and Fiona Jones, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you for having us. Oh, it's great. Uh, Both from the world of entertainment, we're going to find all sorts of wonderful things. And uh, I was fascinated, Paul. Somebody once said of you, is there anything Paul Jones cannot do? (laughs) Lots. (laughs) But I I think we're going to find out as we go through that both Paul and Fiona have done an awful lot as they've gone through their life. So I'm I'm looking forward to uh, hearing it. And I I know many of our viewers are. Um, Paul, l- let's begin at the beginning. I mean, here you are now, um, many years on, if I can put it like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, l- many, many achievements behind you. Let's go back to the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your early life, what it was like. Well, uh, my father was in the Navy and uh, was away a lot. And when he was home, we used to go to church regularly. <laughs> Um, I, I would say we were nominal. My, my brother and I used to bunk off. They used to send us to church service on Sunday mornings and not go themselves. And then we might go as a family in the evening. But sometimes my brother and I would, you know... Disappear somewhere yeah. else. <laughs> and we got, we got found out because the penny that my... <laughs> the old penny that my father had given my brother to put in the collection plate on the Sunday morning, my brother still had on the Sunday evening, and he was <laughs> caught with it, and uh, whoops, there was, there was a bit of a strapping there. Right. But uh, so, so, you know, I mean, we, we were sort of, yes, definitely nominal Christians. I, I, I had a sort of very happy childhood, really, with a sort of single, slight ma that uh, my dad was away so often. Right. And for so long. Right. It's not like that nowadays. But no, I mean, really. in those days, he, he, literally, we wouldn't see him for two and a half, three years sometimes. Really? As yeah. long as that? Mm. Wow. So, yeah, so that obviously had some effect on you. Um, but you, you would only sort of go to church when he was there. So you, you turned up about every two or three years, did no, you, no. at church? <laughs> I, th- I, think, I think we probably went... Uh, with my mother when, when he wasn't there. Yeah. But I mean, my, my memory of all that is fairly dim, really. I, don't, I remember the times when we went on, you know, two famille. Right, yeah. <laughs> Fiona, it, it, it was similar for you in one way, in, in the sense of a Christian home that, that you felt. But you sort of started looking for God in all sorts of different ways as well. T- t- tell us about your background. And- well, yes, I think you're right. We, we, we all were believers. We would call ourselves Christians. In fact, when my mother was a little girl, she said she had a real, real sense of God and she used to go to church. She grew up in Wales. But I think she says now that she kind of lost her way a bit. So when I was growing up, although we would have called ourselves Christians, believers, Really, we weren't at all. We didn't know God intimately. I mean, we knew things about God, but that doesn't mean you're a Christian. And later on, um, as I grew up, things went a little bit uh, sort of pear-shaped for my dear mother. She's wonderful. By the way, she loves this station, Revelation. (laughs) She loves it. And she's a great blessing, and she's a wonderful believer now. But my father left when I was about three, my mother found out that he was having an affair, which was very, very painful indeed. Mm-hmm. And I grew up aching for his love, you know, desperately wanting his love. I was really looking for that unconditional love, you know, that we all really are, are wanting. And, and actually only God can fill that need for unconditional love. But I started to look in uh, spiritual 
darkness, really. Um, the occult, fortune tellers, mediums, spiritualists. I thought that that was, you know, going to give me answers to life when I was going through a very dark time, empty time, wondering why my father didn't love me, even though my mother was a great mother, a wonderful mother. Um, and I started to do that with my mother, in fact. The pair of us did. And we thought we'd find answers. Of course, we didn't. I mean, years later, I found out that in the Bible, um, you know, all of that occult stuff, God says, whatever you do, don't go near those practices. In the book of Leviticus, he actually says that, that right. mediums, familiar spirits, all that kind of thing is dangerous. They're evil spirits. God is a spirit, and uh, we are called by him. He wants to be our father. And, uh, but there is evil spirit out that's there, right. and that's unfortunately what we got involved in, and that made our lives very, very dark indeed. Because, as you say, when you don't know, when you haven't heard yeah. that, it because there's the temptation of knowing the future, the temptation of being in control of life and, and knowing where it's going. And, of course, that really is tempting for many people to go down that line, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. When you're hurting, and at that time my dear mum was hurting because of the marriage not going right. Uh, she was in a second marriage and there were difficult things going on and I was hurting in various ways. You think, well, maybe they can give us an answer. But the thing is, there are evil spirits in this earth. There are angels as well, sent of God to minister and look after those of us who believe mm. in Jesus Christ. Mm. But there are also evil spirits who can tell uh, someone who's like a medium yes. about you, about your life. Yeah. That's why people come out of a, a meeting and they say, but they knew that, you know, I've got an auntie called Betty or whatever. And uh, that can lead people down the wrong way. But it's dark, it's dangerous, it's very dangerous. And uh, unfortunately, it opened the door to a great deal of evil and it came into our lives. And really, I think we would all say from my family, we lived some years of oppression because of that darkness, but all of my family are now saved That's and Christians. Right. And we'll get on to that. As we say, it's, it's great to see you there with that smile on your face now. So, yeah, that was it. And that's such an encouragement for anybody watching that is there at the moment. There is a way out. Yes, and by the end of this program, we will have clearly shown that way out as well. Yeah. Uh, but we haven't got there yet. Now, now Paul, are you obviously um, are known very much for, for music. Um, how did your interest in music start? Where, where did that all begin? Oh, very, very early, I think. Um... I, I did have a um, quite good childish treble, as Shakespeare put it. Um, uh, and so it, at school, there, there were compulsory auditions, actually, for the local cathedral choir. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it was at that point discovered what, what my parents already knew, because we had, <clears throat> we had sort of musical evenings at, at my home. And um, my mother played the piano quite well, and my father played the violin not quite so well. <laughs> And, um, and we all sang, and uh, <clears throat> my mother used to make me sing Velia Ovelia, the Witch of the Wood, <laughs> which was a soprano uh, song. Anyway, uh, you're not going to give us a rendering now, no, are you? No, <laughs> I, I promise. Um, but anyway, so we, we, had, we had that kind of music going on in our house. I, I, I mean, I, I was dutiful about that kind of music. I didn't, in, I didn't actually like it, uh, never have. And uh, so that went on. And then a, a couple of boys in the year above me at school um, started teaching me about jazz. And at the age of like, 14 or something, I mean, I was in the cathedral choir singing all that stuff. Well, I quite liked some of that. Yes. Um, but uh, so, suddenly I learned about you know, Louis Armstrong and things like that. And I was, I was gone. I was away. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, I started buying records, Louis Armstrong, Jelly Roll Morton, yeah. Sidney Bechet, all those people. And I, I gradually s s noticed that I liked the ones with singing more than the ones without. And of the ones with singing, I liked the ones that had that 12-bar blues format. Yeah. And um, I said, by the age of, well, by the time I was 15, of course, Lonnie Donegan had already had his... <laughs> 
big hit Rock Island Line. Yeah. And that yes. led a generation Absolutely. into uh, Big Bill Brunsey and Lead Belly and mm. all those blues people. And that's it. I was done for. Uh, you're, you're taking me down memory lane there, yeah. boy. You, yeah. <laughs> you really are. It's partly my job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're great at it, can I say. Um, but uh, you, you actually uh, also have won many awards for the harmonica. and w- w- That's not an easy instrument to play. Where, where did that start? Um, well, it just, you know, shortly after... Um, Lead Belly and Big Bill Brunsey came Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee and Sonny Terry of course is an absolutely tremendous harmonica player. I, I never wanted to play because of him. Uh, it was later on when I started to hear the Muddy Waters band with Little Walter playing and that's when I wanted to play. And I picked up the harmonica and I you know I suppose when I was at university I, I really started to, to work on it and um, I got absolutely nowhere for a very long time. And then I met Brian Jones, who um, at that point was not yet the Rolling Stones. And um, we, had, we actually played, to, he played guitar, and we, we actually played a bit together. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, Brian, I'm just getting nowhere with this harmonica. And he said, well, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you know you're doing that wrong. Um, he said, you, you've got a C harmonica there, and you're trying to play it in the key of C. I said, yes. No, he said, don't. Um, try and play it in the key of G. In other words, don't take the bottom hole on the, the left as your root note. Take the draw note out of the second hole and make that... Well, we all know exactly what you're talking about. Say, it. Yeah. What on earth does that mean? <laughs> well, you know, they, there's a scale where you blow, suck, blow, suck, blow, etc. Yeah. And, and so he said, tra- d- play it in the key of G breakthrough yeah. within weeks even days I could play mm. and um, that was a lot of years ago that was um, 50 years ago right. wow um, and let's just take it a step further before we go back to Fiona and, and obviously Manfred Mann was uh, where most people will have known you from and, and, mm. uh, and that. H- how did that start I mean, how, how did that come? Because it was, it was a very particular sound uh, yeah. for, for those well, days. Well, the hub of rhythm and blues in those days was a gentleman called Alexis Corner, who had a group called Alexis Corner's Blues Incorporated. And uh, very, very good. <clears throat> um, Mike Hug and Manfred Mann had a jazz group, and they weren't making a living. And they decided that compromise was necessary. They didn't want to play pop music or rock or whatever it was. And so they said, we'll play rhythm and blues. And at the time, I was, you know, sitting in with Alexis Corner. When Alexis Corner would play at the Marquee Club in Soho, um, I would would sort of jump up once or twice. And he he would say, you, get up. He was very encouraging. Mm. And, and, and so when um, Mike and Manfred wanted a singer, they went to the Marquee Club and said, we need a singer. And, and they said, you might try this chap, Paul Jones. So um, they did, and I got the job. Mm. And, yeah, uh, one of the reasons why uh, uh, Manfred Mann was um, unusual and quite recognisable was that there was this sort of strong jazz influence and a strong blues influence as well. So it... It stayed that way mm. until I left. <laughs> <laughs> Fiona, I, 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 you became an actress and a singer in, in your own right. And of course, this is before the two of you a, a, a yes. actually met. Yes. Uh, um, d- tell us a little bit about your career development. And I, I suppose the question which I looked at as I was going through it, you were searching for something, and it seems you were searching for something all the way through your life. Did, did becoming an actress, becoming a singer satisfy you or were you still looking for something more? You know, that's what I thought. I thought it was going to satisfy me. It's amazing, isn't it, that we think sometimes. When I was about 19 years of age, I mean, I trained uh, to dance. I trained a little bit in voice. 
um, not much as an actress, a little bit, but then at, as, as, as I was 19 years of age, I saw an audition advertised at the back of the stage newspaper. Are you familiar with the yes, stage? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And of course they have auditions, and it was for Elvis. Yes. The life story of Elvis Presley was going to be on uh, in the West End at the Astoria Theatre. Actually, it was up and running already. And they said, open auditions, they were needing a girl. There were four girls in it, and one girl was leaving. And I just thought, oh, I want to be, oh, if I could just be in a West End show, you know, that's what yeah. I thought then. And I really did think, as you're thinking, yeah, as you're saying, you know, you think that these dreams are going to just do it all. Yeah. Anyway, I went for the audition, turned up. There were girls all queuing round the block, you know, all dressed up in their kind of show business outfits and silver shoes and sparkly makeup and all of that. And I wasn't. And I queued and finally I got to the side of the stage and they announced me. And I walked onto this big stage, lights in my face and they said you know what are you going to sing and I, I mean I I was just so frightened I was so nervous but I had loved the story of Jesus Christ Superstar well the musical of Jesus Christ Superstar when I had when I was 12 my auntie took me to see that in the West End for my birthday and oh I just loved it we sat second row from the front and I'll never forget when that curtain went back. I mean, the music yes. of Jesus Christ Superstar is wonderful, yes. but it's not accurate with the Bible, <laughs> the musical itself. No, I mean, it there are bits there that are. There are bits but there's a lot. Of it. Tim but, the, Rice, but the music gets you, doesn't it? It does. Yes. Tim Rice, Andrew Lloyd Webber. But the general story, and mm. as a 12-year-old, not knowing the gospel story, not no. knowing much about Jesus, this was my way of seeing mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Mm. And of course, they acted it beautifully. And this being came on all dressed in white and I fell in love with him. I just fell in love with him. And of course, you know, Jesus, it says, doesn't it, in the Bible that Jesus went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Mm -hmm. And of course, right before my eyes, that's what they were acting out. Him healing, you know, giving sight to the blind, a lame person can walk, you know, bringing love and forgiveness and telling everyone about how they can live knowing God. And of course, I, as a child, I just loved him. I loved this. But then the story kept going. Mm -hmm. And the religious leaders of the day, you know, they weren't happy about that, That's were right. they? That's right. It's amazing that. <laughs> and on they came. Soldiers came onto the stage, took Jesus and arrested him. And I was watching this. And it really had an effect on me. It really affected me as they beat him, they, you know, spat at him and they punched him and they put a crown of thorns on his head and crucified him. Sitting there, I'll never forget that. I mean, that really, really went in. But of course, I didn't understand what he was doing, why he was crucified, why had he gone to the cross? Right. Do you know, I, I sometimes think if somebody had come on that stage that night... And preached the gospel. Absolutely. <laughs> As he was hanging on that cross and said why he was there, yeah. I, I think I would have yeah. become a Christian. But take it back to this audition at Elvis where we left. Well, that's <laughs> what I was going to say. Yeah, they, they, I mean, Elvis was very different, but presumably you sang something from Jesus I Christ. I did. I, I was so moved by this show yes. that I sang Mary Madeline's song, I yeah. Don't Know How to Love Him. Yes. It's quite marvellous, that song, if you yeah. think about yes. it. And the words, again, are not yeah. correct, but a lot of it is when she says... I don't know how to love him because I've never been loved like this before. Mm. Mary mm. Madeline, it's written in the Bible, had been possessed with demons. Mm. And when she met Jesus, she was, yeah, she healed. was healed. Delivered. She, she was delivered. Mm. So I sang that for my audition. Right. And um, to my absolute amazement, um, this musical director just came forward afterwards and he said, Fiona, I said, yes, you know, trembling, <laughs> shaking. I mean, I couldn't spit sixpence in that audition. I was so nervous. But right. he said, you've got the job. Yeah. So that was my first entrance into show business. And then it was not long after that that I joined the Royal National Theatre mm. um, to do a show called Guys and Dolls. Yes. A yes. wonderful yeah. musical. <laughs> and eventually, this very handsome man beside me... <laughs> <laughs> um, joined to play Sky Masterson mm. and I originally went doing a very small part but then I was given the role of Sarah Brown 
and we played Lovers opposite each other. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, there, there, there's this wonderful description I read when I was researching of the two of you looking into each other's eyes every night, singing these songs, and eventually it became true. <laughs> yes, <laughs> life imitating art. Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> but... Uh, and, and, of course, you did actually play in Jesus Christ Superstar, didn't you, at, at I one did point? do that. Yes. I did yes. the role, not in the actual show in the West End, but no. there were some wonderful um, concert versions at the mm. Barbican in London, and yeah. I did Mary Madeline. And do you know something? It was amazingly moving, because we did it in a concert version. So the, the cast were actually sitting so, on the side yes. of the stage with the scripts, yes. and then they'd get up to yeah, sing their the bit scene. with yes. the orchestra. Yeah. And do you know, I saw just people in the audience just weeping. pouring, weeping yes. and weeping. So even though effect. it wasn't maybe as accurate with the Bible, it was telling the story enough mm. to really, really touch, touch people's them. hearts. Uh, we'll we come on to that. Um, and, but I, I want to go back to something uh, with you, Paul. Um, your famous debate with Cliff Richard. <laughs> when you were this confirmed atheist, uh, I, I think I think it was over Billy Graham, uh, was it? T tell us about that. Well, uh, I had become an atheist at the age of fifteen, and I was uh, quite noisy about it as well. You know, let's get a quote from Paul Jones. You know? <laughs> and um, <laughs> I went on like that for a long, long time. And then one day they said, "You know, would you come on television and argue with Cliff Richard?" I said, "Will I what?" <laughs> you know, I mean. The idea of arguing with Cliff Richard was attractive to me because I detested him. He was a Christian after all. Yeah. And honestly, I mean, not only that, but of course the truth of the matter is I envied him because although by that time we'd had some hits, we were never going to have as many as <laughs> Cliff. And I thought it was, he'd had his go. It was time for him to move over. <laughs> anyway, I went on the, that program, yes. And the subject was uh, Billy Graham. I mean, I scarcely knew who Billy Graham was, but I said, D don't worry, I'll get on there and argue with Cliff. You know, that'd be, I'll be happy to do that. And I did, and I was absolutely horrible to Cliff. I really was. Mm. Um, anything he said, I just, I just twisted it slightly. And then I said, you see, Cliff, what you've actually just said is, and then I would tell him what he hadn't just said. <laughs> I mean, it was very wrong yeah um but uh i walked out of that studio so happy with myself because i thought oh yes we've just beaten you know one of britain's most famous christians in an argument yeah uh, or in a debate i should say and um i thought so highly of myself <laughs> for a long long time <laughs> but, but were, you, were you actually satisfied in that atheism or at that time maybe you were I, I, I don't know I but, at, at that, time, at that I had, time you were yeah at that time I had convinced myself that it was a, a, a tenable position and that um, Christians were just unfortunately for them not as bright as me and, <laughs> no really um, but then as time went by it began to crumble slightly and I can look back now at times. I mean, for instance, I remember when I did a film called Privilege in 19... I think it came out in 67? Is it right out there? And um, I was interviewed by a very nice man from a, one of the daily newspapers. And he said, I understand you're an atheist. And I said, yes. And he said, isn't that a rather bleak position, right? yeah. point of view? And I said, oh, no. Because, um, you know, Christians believe that after after this physical death you go on to another life or another much longer death and um, I said atheists just believe that you extinguish at the point of physical death I said that's much more comforting and when I when I actually look back on that now and hear myself saying that now I think you actually didn't believe yourself you know <laughs> you really didn't <laughs> You kind of believe what you were yes. talking about. And, and then um, I started a band in 1979 because I was, I've been working as an atheist, as, <laughs> yeah, as an atheist. I've been working as an actor <laughs> for 10 years, an atheist actor. And um, I, I was missing music. And I started this band, the blues band. And uh, it, it, it got pretty successful in everything. And... I was a bit concerned because I'd gone off the rails in the 60s somewhat 
uh, not as badly as some people, but mm -hmm. I had. And I didn't want that to continue. And I thought, well, I, I need some sort of hobby that will keep me peaceful and calm and actually detached. Because I noticed that the problem with being in a rock band and all that sort of thing is that you actually start believing your publicity. And, that, and, and when you're right in the center of that sort of maelstrom of excitement, you start not being able to deal with it. And that's when people turn to drugs and drink mm -hmm. and serial sex and all that sort of stuff. And so uh, I thought, no, uh, stand back from that. And so I, I'd always liked looking at paintings, and I decided that I was going to um, have that as my really big hobby. So wherever we were in the world, I would get up in the morning two hours earlier than necessary to, to make the next trip to wherever we were playing that night and go to an art gallery. And it didn't really matter if it was just like a little tiny local amateur watercolor <laughs> sort of gallery or a huge national gallery somewhere. And uh, I, I began over a long period of, well, a period of 18 months, two years, to become very excited about a German artist from two centuries ago called Caspar Friedrich. And Friedrich was extraordinary. Uh, to this day, people don't, I've, I've read, you know, criticisms and descriptions of his paintings in newspapers and magazines, and they don't understand what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. But why? Because they haven't grasped the fact that he was a born again, spirit filled, really? believing Christian. I mean, a really serious yeah. Christian. Yeah. So much so that people took the mickey out of him in those days. Well, um, I began to look at these pictures and one of the things that fascinated me was... And you didn't know he was a Christian at that no, point? No, even at that point I didn't yes. realise it, yeah. no. But yes. uh, he, he would paint religious paintings, but I said, oh, you know, doesn't everybody, you know, I mean, the, the patronage and all that sort of stuff, you've got to do yeah, it, yeah. make the money. Um, but, but, but he would also, of course, paint things that were not Christian. And, and I, these fascinated me because the more I looked at them, the more I realised that despite the fact that there would be nothing in the subject matter that said anything about faith, mm -hmm. I would know that they were spiritual works. Right. I still hadn't got it, you know, yeah. that he was a Christian. And, yeah. But I just somehow knew that those were spiritual works. And this totally fascinated me. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that actually there's something in me that can recognize something that's spiritual. Mm. And if that's true, then there's something spiritual in me. Right. And if that's true, then I can't be an atheist. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, God has his ways of just beginning to break through, yes. doesn't he, for, for, yes. for, for everybody. W wonderful little irony, which I only discovered many, many years ago, was that when Cliff Richard did that adaptation of Wuthering Heights, yes. played the part of Heathcliff, I never saw that show. But somebody told me, I think maybe even Cliff or somebody close to him yeah. told me, that the, all the sets for that show were on designs based on the works of Caspar Friedrich. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Um, so you meet, staring into one another's eyes and, and, and eventually basically falling in love. And, uh, but it wasn't... It wasn't all that easy, was it, at the time either? I mean, there were still ways to go because you were both still not Christian and, and, and was still that was a little way off. But what was it like? I mean, did things change for you radically at that point? H how did that develop? Well, we started working together. Uh, we were doing Guys and Dolls, but we were also doing another show called The Beggar's Opera, which was also a play with music so we were doing it in repertory at the National Theatre. I just knew, do you know, I just knew something wasn't right in my life. I knew I was falling in love with this man but I just knew somehow deep down inside that I was kind of living que sera sera, mm. whatever will be will be. I just didn't have any control over my life. It was like I was out of control. I was just doing the next thing and the next thing in my life. But would it be all right? And I'd seen suffering in friends and different people, even my own family. And I thought, how do I stop that? Mm. How do I, I'm, I'm in love with this man. And he was telling me he loved me by now. Um, but what if I go into this relationship and I blow it? What if we, go further and I can't 
deal with this. It was like a sort of help. I need some kind of help. And this business about God was still in me. And I used to go to Paul's dressing room and we used to have cups of tea. And I remember talking about God to you. Do you remember mm. that? I said to you, I'm a Christian because I really thought I was. I thought, well, because I didn't disbelieve, you see, I thought that made me a Christian, but really I didn't know God. I didn't have any intimacy with him. And I remember saying, but, but I'm a Christian. And Paul said, well, I'm not an atheist anymore, but I don't know what I am. Well, God knew our dilemma. Yes. He knew we were in a dilemma and he wanted to get the gospel over to us. And he did a brilliant thing. One day, whilst I was doing these shows at the National Theatre, I was also doing a radio play in London, uh, in Langham Place, right. at the BBC. And I finished doing the radio play, I came out, and in front of me was this beautiful church. A church which is actually quite famous, I didn't it know is. it at the time, it's called All Souls Langham Place. And I, I thought, what a wonderful building. And then I had an overwhelming sense go into the church. Now, that might sound completely normal to you, but by now, I wasn't that lovely little 12-year-old who'd gone to see Jesus Christ Superstar, who would have become a Christian if I'd only understood the gospel then. I was now quite a hard young woman. I was only in my early 20s, but I was angry with my father because he hadn't been able to love me at that time. I had a lot of insecurities, and now I didn't like churches because I thought, well, we don't need church, we don't need organized religion, what do we need that for? Everybody can just do their own thing, that was my attitude. But there was this overwhelming walk into the church. I now know it was God mm -hmm. doing this. Mm -hmm. I went into the church, it was completely empty, no one in there. I sat down in one of the seats, and in front of all the seats were Bibles. And I, I just found my hand reaching for this Bible. And I am thinking to myself, as I'm putting the Bible on my knee, what are you doing this for? The Bible is just full of contradictions, I used to think. I hadn't read it, of course. I flipped it open, just like that. I wouldn't have known where to look. I looked down, and the Bible was open, second half of the Bible. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was John. It was chapter 3, it was verse 16. <laughs> now, we know now, don't we, that that's very famous, but I had not a clue. And it was like it was lit up, like mm. there was a light on it. And this is what it said, for those who, who might not be aware, as we weren't in those days. It said this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but we'll have everlasting life. Do you know what? It was like an arrow just hit my heart. I just knew that I knew that I knew that this was true. I didn't understand it. I didn't know what eternal life was. I didn't know that eternal life is God's presence in you and with you in this life and then forevermore you being with him. No, I didn't understand that, but I saw that it said that without believing in Jesus, we could perish. But if we believed in him, he'd give us this eternal life. And I sat there and I thought the only intelligent thing to do is find out what eternal life is mm -hmm. and get to know this Jesus. And I remember just, I mean, my heart was racing and I went back to the theater that night. I knocked on Paul's dressing room door. He opened the door. And I remember the first thing that I said to you was, please don't laugh at me. <laughs> but I went into yeah. a church today and I read the Bible. Mm. And I said, Paul, there's something called eternal life. And I said, you have to believe in Jesus. And you know, I want to tell you right now that at that time in my life, I'd been embarrassed about Jesus. Mm. I didn't mind saying I believed in God. But I, I thought it was rather sort of cheesy to say you believed in Jesus. I didn't want to be one of those Jesus people. I had no clue that he himself is God, mm. how wonderful he is. I said to Paul, Paul, I have got to go to that church on Sunday. I have got to find out about Jesus. And, and you said, I'm not laughing at you. He said, I'm coming with you. Right. So you, he, Paul, came with me, didn't you? I mean, 
you, you know, you, you couldn't write a script like this, could you, really? <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in the final analysis. I mean, it is absolutely amazing how God yeah. broke into your life. Yeah. But I guess he saw your hearts. I guess he saw this, this searching. I guess he saw this, um, this longing. Yeah. And uh, that, that was it. Pick up the story, Paul, it was, as to what it, developed. The, the, the longing was coming from sort of different angles, but it, it was definitely there for both of us. And I think, I think God knows who he can use, even before you know you can yes. be used. Yes. You know? And, uh, we, well, so we went, to, we went to All Souls that particular day, that Sunday, and it was terrific, wasn't it? Oh, I mean, it was, it, it was, it was. I had this thing about churches, you know, that there'd be three people in them. <laughs> the vicar, the verger, and a very old lady. Yeah. <laughs> and that would be that. Um, and here we go into this place, and it's crammed. Yeah. Absolutely to the rafters, you know. Yeah. And, and it's lively and light and relevant and un understandable and all that sort of stuff that... I mean, I'd sung in cathedral choir in Portsmouth for years, and I'd, I'd missed everything, you know. <laughs> but here we were in that church, and basically the upshot of it was we, we started to go there. Mm. However, there was a problem. Um, having fallen in love at work, we'd, uh, by that time, we'd decided to get ourselves a flat mm. together, and we were living in, in sin. Mm. And... Uh, well, that was weird, going to church and living in... But actually, people did it and people do it. Mm. It's not very wise. In fact, it's dangerous. And um, God had a, exactly the right person to rescue us. <laughs> the phone rings one day, and it's Cliff on the yeah. phone. <laughs> and, uh, He'd he, forgiven you by then, had he? <laughs> long since. Yeah. Yeah. Long since. <laughs> I said, to, one time I said to Cliff, this is after we'd become Christian, I'm going, going forward. Yeah, yeah. I said to him, y you must have, you must have hated me that day, come on, you know. Well, how did you deal with that? And he said oh, it was easy. He said, I if you remember, I had a couple of friends with me. Well, yes, I remember them, and, and in fact, we know them. Yeah. Um, he said, well, the three of us went back to the dressing room they'd given me, and we prayed for you. <laughs> well, of course, now I know that he was only doing what Jesus instructed us to do. Matthew chapter 5 and parallels in the other Gospels. Pray for those who treat you spitefully. Well, I treated Cliff spitefully, so he prayed for me. I mean, that was, you know. But, I mean, knowing that that's what Jesus said we have to do wasn't all there was about it. The other part of it was Cliff did it. Yes. Yeah. And, I mean, I, I could think of thousands of people who wouldn't yeah. and uh, I th so it did change my attitude to him so when he rang up that day <laughs> I, I didn't know this at that point but when he rang up that day he was inviting us to go and hear Luis Palau yeah. at um, White City Stadium and uh, I said well I don't know because <laughs> <laughs> there we, we were going to church but I have this theory now that behind our backs, various people at All Souls Langham Place, <laughs> who were not unknown to Cliff Richard, in fact right. played tennis with him from yeah. time to time, uh, had said, yeah, you, we've got to do something about these two yeah. because they've got a problem. And um, if, if the problem continues, the Bible says this for you, if the problem goes on after you've spoken to them, then eventually you have to say to them, look, you either got to solve this problem or you have to not come to this church mm -hmm. um, fortunately it never got to that yeah, stage yeah, yes. because Cliff said pick any night out of the next month that Luis Palau will be there and, um, and I'll buy you dinner afterwards so we, we picked a night <laughs> and we went and it was a beautiful mm. beautiful summer's evening and Cliff sang a couple of songs and then Luis Palau got up and preached out of Romans chapter 1, Paul's letter to the Romans. And, um, well, it was, it was a powerful, powerful, unforgettable, of course, mm -hmm. evening. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things about that evening that focused my mind, uh, possibly yours as well, was that there was a small 
group of maybe 20 people who were very, very hostile to the entire situation. Now, you've got to recognize that this place holds 16,000 yes. people, and it was full. And there's 20 people trying to disrupt everything, handing out leaflets which say, don't believe anything this man says. He's a fraud and a charlatan, and so is the whole of Christianity, <laughs> or words very much to that effect. And they started sort of booing and shouting, and it was so pitiful and, sorry, pitiable and pathetic that it kind of made me think, I think I'd rather be with him. <laughs> <laughs> the man down there on the platform yeah. and focus our minds even more precisely on what Luis Palau was saying mm -hmm. and it was it was it was so powerful to us mm. I mean he was talking about well, one of the things he was talking about was people not making commitments and of course that went zong straight in you know because there we were living together yeah. we loved each other yes. why not make a commitment and here he was telling us that there's a problem nowadays with people making commitments. Mm. And it's absolutely true. Mm. Uh, you, get, you get people in show business, I mean in Hollywood and all those areas, and before they get married, they, they say they love each other, and before they get married they enter into, what is it called, a marriage contract? Yes, yes. Which actually says who gets the Picasso and who gets the Rembrandt the when they divorce. divorce. Yes. So in other words, what they're saying is, this is not a commitment. And uh, I mean, and Luis Palau was like drawing our attention to that. And, and we just thought, well, why not? Why mm. not, you know? And of course, everything he said, ev everything in that uh, first chapter of Romans, it, it, well, certainly from verse 16 onwards, is really about people who resist or turn away from God. And of course, I turned away from God when I was 15 years old. Although I didn't really know him when I was 15, I was going to church every week twice and singing and going to choir practice and all that sort of stuff. And I had very much turned away. So at the end of this evening, both of you, first of all, commit your lives to the Lord. Definitely, clearly, yeah? We, well, actually, it was sort of walking away because the thing was, <laughs> Luis Palau said, if you feel that God's been talking to you at all through anything that I've said this evening, come down onto the pitch and we have these lovely counsellors or stewards yeah. or helpers of some sort, what, you know, you can talk to them. And, and Fiona stood up and I grabbed her arm and I said, where are you going? <laughs> and she said, well, where do you think I'm going? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give my life to Jesus. And I said, fantastic, where am I sleeping tonight? Because I, I, I realized there and then that it, the game was up. Mm. We were not going to go on living the way we'd it's been living. It's interesting how the Word of God got to you oh. immediately. Powerfully, I mean, yes. It, 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 it has to be God because other people can just sort of go through with that. But God so dealt with you, didn't yes. he? Oh, that, really? That, that, on that dealt with one is evening. a good expression. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, it was, it was kind of walking. We, we, still had, we still had dinner with Cliff coming up, you know. And, of course, Luis Palau was there and various other people that Cliff had invited. See, there was, I mean, that impressed me for a start. Yeah. Um, to find out then or subsequent, very soon afterwards, that Cliff had actually invited something well over a hundred people to go all in show business, mm. to go and hear Louise. Mm. And I mean, I could name you some of the people yeah. who were there that night yes. but didn't make a commitment. But, yeah. you know, so what? Uh, but Cliff was so obedient to the Lord. Mm. I mean, I can imagine just that particular moment when, he, when the Lord said, and uh, Paul Jones. And Cliff said, no, Lord, <laughs> no, I think him. you must be mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> but this man, what this man did, he said, well, where am I sleeping tonight when I was about to go down the front yes. to pray the prayer of salvation? And, 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 I and you said, said, don't worry about that. I we'll said, sort that out. I said, I've got to pray this yeah. prayer, Paul. Yeah. I cannot leave the stadium mm. without turning mm. to Jesus Christ tonight. And Paul, you said, me too. But then you said... Well, will you marry me then? Yeah. <laughs> That's the, I was glad you said I, I, I did. did not know if that was true. You actually did propose right at the end yes. of that. Actually, it was in the, in the stadium. In the stadium. Or was it walking back? 
uh, walking to the yeah. place where we were having the, going to have the dinner. I, I thought it was. I can't remember, but anyway, it was. It was, anyway, anyway, it, was, it, was it was part of that evening, yeah. <laughs> definitely. And you know, the the thing that was just so amazing that I remember from that mm. night were two amazing things. The first thing that Louis Palau read from Romans chapter one, he read, "I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ," and that sentence yeah. just. Oh, because that's what I'd been, was ashamed. Yes, yes. And the second thing that really spoke to me, as you were saying, that God speaks, was all the way through him speaking about the love of God, how much he loves us, how much he wants to forgive us, mm. how much he wants to draw us to himself and give us a new heart, a new life. He kept saying, so are you right with God? Mm. Are you right? If you were to die right now, tonight, are you right? He kept saying that right through his sermon, are you right with God? And I sat there and it was as if I was the only one in the stadium. Yeah. I kept thinking to myself, I'm not right mm. with God. Mm -hmm. I'm not right with God. And I was mm. bursting for him to pray a prayer because he kept saying, I'm going to pray a prayer. <laughs> I'm going to pray a prayer for you to get right with God. And I thought, get on with it <laughs> because I just felt like I so want to get right. And there's something so amazing. The moment I prayed that prayer, I have to tell you this. Not only did I feel so clean, mm. like every sin mm. I'd ever committed, every bit of gossip, every bit of bitterness and selfishness and pride and rudeness and every other horrid thing you can think of, I knew it was gone. But this is the wonderful and marvelous thing. The anger and unforgiveness I had toward my father left. Praise God. Yeah. It was like the moment I said sorry to the Lord, the moment I said, Jesus, come into my heart, I am so sorry for every sin I've ever committed. I am so sorry to have sinned against you. Mm -hmm. It was like that moment I was able to see that my father didn't mean to do those things that he'd done to me. Mm -hmm. And it was like, let him. Go, <laughs> forgive him. It's great. Isn't it, it was a freedom, isn't great. it lovely? Yeah, and 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 of course God has continued to change you. Has it? I mean, what what were some of the things that you had to face? Because I, I know you're not in show business, more, but obviously in a lot of other things. But Paul, you still very much are involved. What what were some of the things you had to face? What what changed? from that moment where Christ really came into your life? Well, actually, for me, I Im immediately wanted to leave the music business right. altogether. Um, wonderfully, one of the team of pastors at All Souls said no. He said, well, you're naked, what would you do? I said, well, I've always had a suspicion that I'd be rather good as a librarian. <laughs> No, why are you laughing? He would be. You'd be a wonderful I'm librarian, very, but very, I don't... I'm very good at cataloguing things. Well, after all you've... No, I was laughing because I, I was thinking, y yes, you would. After all you've shared with me to, uh, you know, of this programme, of, of all the people and you know, all the jazz and that, I thought, yeah, he would, he would have it all absolutely right, wouldn't he? <laughs> yes. I, I, I said this to this pastor and he said, um, he said, do you suppose if God wanted a, a librarian, he couldn't have got one of those saved? <laughs> what wisdom. That, what really, wisdom. that really spoke to me yes. very, very... And actually, he put us in touch with James Fox, didn't he? Yeah. Because, you know, James had, yes. was, was actually still acting. Yes. And, um, you know, having, having actually got saved and left the profession, but then gone back to it. I think that's the, the right way mm -hmm. around. Um, but anyway, so but you, you're in your old job still, but... It changes because, and, it, and it's not, it's actually no different if you're in show business, really, from any other job. You just do your job differently you, because you, you must do everything you do for God. Mm. Uh, otherwise, it's, you, you're wasting, wasting your salvation. Right. And, and so that, which, which actually means some pretty severe changes, quite radical changes mm. sometimes. I mean, if you've been strutting around stages for All thirty years, year, best part of thirty <laughs> years, and um, and 
No, actually, at that point, it was only just over 20 years. We've been strutting around stages for a couple of decades. And the focus, as far as you're concerned, is me. Um, then to go and do that, uh, but the focus is not me. Yes. The focus is Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, th I, I got very excited about an actress, a, an a Italian actress called Eleonora Duza, who was who became saved, became a Christian, born again Christian, and her whole life changed, and her whole method of working as an actress changed, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this this. Well, fascinated me. <laughs> but I thought, isn't that right? You do, you, everything has to change. Yes. Everything has to change. Everything does change. Mm -hmm. And I was in show business for quite a long time after, after I'd become a Christian. Mm -hmm. So I started to wonder what parts I could take. Right. Oh, that it's too, amazing yeah. what you do before you know God. When suddenly you said, Lord Jesus, fill me with your spirit. You think differently. Absolutely. You look at things and you think, I don't want to play that horrible, nasty piece of work, you know. <laughs> what is that going to bring to an audience? Exactly the part that every actress in London wants. <laughs> I know, yes. I know. Yeah. They can have it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, obviously, 25 years of, of a radio program uh, going on, still winning awards and, and, and still doing that. But you, you've added to that now aren't you? I mean uh, you, you're teaching courses on marriage and you're you seem to be putting back into people's lives the the very things that God has put into your lives mm. you are seeking to put into other people is, is that how you see it is that how, what you feel God is doing with you these days yes it built up very slowly what happened was people got to hear that we were now Christians so what happened was that churches would say oh Will you come and share your testimony? And then other things developed bit by bit. And yes, you see, when you see victory, when you've suffered and gone through things, and you see victory in your life because of the Word of God, because of God in your life, and you've been changed, you think, oh, I'd love to share this with someone else. Mm -hmm. And then you're amazed that people are hungry to hear. And so mm -hmm. we get invited to do outreaches and I do sort of ladies' conferences and things like that, and it's just a joy mm. to be able to say, look, I know what it's like to feel I was so insecure. I, was so, I felt so rejected because of my father. I had no confidence, and he's just changed that, and you just want to say, it's all right. Yes. Just, can I share some lovely things with you, and, and stories and things that we've gone through in our marriage and stuff. And, we were actually quite scared when people first started yes. to say, will you come to yes. our church and so on. But nowadays, we, we actually jump at them. We grasp them firmly. Yes. Yes. And we, we go to churches all over the place, yeah. don't we? And, 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 and do you feel, because of who you are, be, be, because of the life that you've been in, sometimes people maybe even listen a little bit more and, and, and respond because, hey, these guys, all that they were, they can come to this place, I can as well. Do, do, do you sense God gives you a, a, a privilege to be able to talk into people's lives like that? Yes. Definitely. I mean, but first of all, um, people actually come because they're curious about the man who sang do wa diddy diddy dum diddy do. Yeah. <laughs> Does and he know anything else? Yes. yes. And also, I mean, they're even uh, interested to see who he's married to. So, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and sometimes I'm so moved by that song, the fact that do wa diddy can get us up there and we can yeah, tell absolutely. people about Jesus. I know. I, I was thinking that. I, I, I thought of those lyrics when I was, when I was preparing. You know? but, but I was thinking, you know, I mean, in one sense, a, absolute gibberish. But, but what God has done for you to be able to communicate now yeah. um, and, and use that period of your life, it, it's amazing what God does, isn't it? Yes. And, and actually, he's using the, the present as well, because we get people coming who's, who come up afterwards and say, I listen to your radio program yes. on Monday nights. Mm -hmm. yes. And, and, and uh, they, they, they come and say, you know, I, I in fact, we've got people who come to see the blues band and they invite us to come to their church as, uh, yes. as a result yes. of yes. Yeah, making, yeah. making that contact. Yeah. That's happened, well, s several times now. Yeah. And, and so all, all, you know, God connects things up, which you think, 
they don't connect, but right. God will make they them do. connect, yes. We're nearly at the end. I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, this period. At the beginning, I, I put that uh, question, is there anything Paul Jones cannot do? I, I, I guess what would be far better to end with is, is, is the question, is there anything God cannot do? Yeah. And, you know, and I, I thank you so much for sharing your lives, what God has done and how God has changed. And I'm sure you've blessed many people today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you, Doug. you. Thank you indeed for being with us. Uh, I pray that God will touch you in whatever aspect um, that God has been speaking to you. And just as Paul and Fiona pray that prayer, find somebody to pray that prayer with so that God can change your life as he has changed Paul and Fiona's. Thank you so much for being with us. See you again very soon. Bye for now.